So thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. Oh, by the way, next, uh, well, the next time, uh, my friend Michelle Chuti will be the speaker, and she has been working really hard in understanding how to help people, you, with Parkinson's disease, swallow better, improve your capacity to speak to. So I will re strongly recommend it. She's, she's also really fun to listen to. So today, um, I'm also a professor in the Department of Medical Physics here at the School of Medicine of Public Health. And my lab is at the private center, like uh, Nancy was saying to you. And the reason is because my research is right there in the border between the basic research and the clinical translation. A lot of the research that my lab does informs clinical trials. They are aimed to help the clinicians help patients. That's the goal of our research. It's not just in a microscope, just looking at the cells. Um, so today, we, I will talk to you about how we use stem cells to understand and find solutions for Parkinson's disease. So let's see if I can get this right. All right. Um, I hope you can see the slides. The, um, the first slide here is showing you all the different areas of the brain and the peripheral nervous system that can be affected with Parkinson's disease. And there is one, let's see if I can get it right. Yes. So you see this red words here, it says substantia nigra. You probably have heard about several times how the, that area of the brain is the main affected or the hallmark of the disease. And I think what is interesting to think is when you look, think about it is, okay, you look at the, uh, what is the main therapy that patients with Parkinson's receive as a treatment is levodopa, dopamine <coughs> replacement. And the reason that uh, the patients receive levodopa is because that area of the brain called substantia nigra, hmm? no, it's not that, it's, oh, this one. Oh boy, what did I do? Uh -huh. Got it. Um, so you see this area here, is the substantia nigra. This is, imagine, you can see this, the side of the brain. Imagine that you cut my head and you see me on the side. You can see me, okay? So here's, in this area of the brain, this is the substantia nigra. The neurons here die and you lose the dopamine that is affected here. But I, I was thinking when I was planning to talk to you, I said, do you know what a cell is, first of all? Do you know what, I know that we all have biology, but sometimes we forget if we became lawyer, became MBAs, you know, very successful business people, or, I don't know, backpackers. Uh, <laughs> but I was thinking, how can I tell you about the research that we are doing? And one of the things that I, it always amazes me to think about is how our bodies are made. How we have all these different cells that are basically the same thing, the same structure. This is a cell. It doesn't matter if a cell is uh, from a monkey, or from a human, from a rat, from a fly. A cell from an animal has the same basic structure. It's this blob, has a membrane, and has in the center of that, of that blob a nucleus. In the nucleus is the recipe book that the cell uses to make all the different proteins that make the cell function. That recipe book is the DNA. You all know about DNA and chromosomes, yes? So it doesn't matter what cell it is, we have the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's a muscle cell, if it's a cell from the pancreas, or if it's a neuron. This, all the cells have the same basic structure, the nucleus, inside this blob with a membrane. You have all that uh, information, the recipe book, and there are all these messengers that transcribe that information that is in the recipe book into proteins, enzymes, molecules, the things that we need to function. With that cell, I told you about the pancreatic cell, the hippocampal cell, the neurons, what is a stem cell? Well, a stem cell is a cell that has the ability to become other types of cells, okay? Can become skin cells, like the skin, or can become a muscle cell or a cardiac cell. But, so basically what we can call stem cells, there are two main categories of stem cells. The cells that are tissue specific, that are there in the tissue to 
help us heal. For example, the cells, when I burn my hand cooking, which I do very often, um, my, thank God I have some of those stem cells that are gonna help repair my skin. And then there is these other cells that we scientists love to use. Oops, I'm not gonna get this right, Nancy. Um, there are the pluripotent stem cells. These pluripotent stem cells are blank slate cells. They can divide rapidly and become virtually any cell type in the body. And those are the embryonic and induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, when you think about pluripotent stem cells, well, the first thing that people think is about embryo, embryos, embryonic stem cells. I, to me, it's amazing, to me, it's almost magical to think that from an egg, we become what we are today with all these different cells, all these different uh, organs that are, all these cells that are organized to make what we are today. It's, to me, it's, it's amazing. And all start in that embryo, in this, those embryonic stem cells that scientists can use now to make all these different type of tissue cultures, including, again, the myocytes, the muscle cells, the pancreatic stem cells, or neurons. But in the last few years, what we have learned is we can transform cells, for example, from the skin and make them into pluripotent stem cells. And those pluripotent stem cells can also become any of these cells, muscle cells, pancreatic cells, or neurons, or other cells. Just, I like those three. Um, so if you think about how the process goes, it's stepwise, it's very um, protracted. We need to go very carefully in the lab. So for example, that um, my friend Sushan Shan, what he likes to do is take a little bit of skin cells and grow them, the fibroblast, and then he exposes the cells to a number of factors that are typical for making stem cells. If you have an embryo, those, those cells are exp that they have the capacity to make all the cells have all these different factors, all these different proteins, then, then, and then can become um, dif uh, de-differentiated and we can collect them and make them into whatever other cell that we want. So we have this very a uh, stepwise approach that we, uh, we have skin cells that we make them into pluripotent stem cells. Now, when we have a stem cells, what is the relationship between stem cells and Parkinson's disease? I, I do hope that you can see it. I, if not, later on, uh, Nancy will have for you uh, a copy of this if you want to. So this is to show you how we envision stem cells. Stem cells can be used for modeling the disease in a dish, but they can also be used as therapies. For disease in a dish, so we can have, for example, stem cells from someone that has Parkinson's and try to understand um, what, test different therapies that, that can help um, uh, the cells to survive, or we can screen for different mutations, meaning that recipe book that is altered, the chromosomes that are altered. And then when we talk about, I'm sorry. So the, the therapies, we have different things, and I'm gonna, so this, the conversation I'm gonna have with you today, first we're gonna talk about how we use the cells in a dish, and then how we use them for, what we are working to make for therapies with stem cells. So if you think about, we want to understand these neurons in the brain, um, you have to think about how neurons, they are different from your regular pancreatic cell, but depending on which area of the brain they are, those cells are different. All neurons have the same basic structure. They have a triangular face. The blob is triangular instead of being round or you know, what shapes that they have. Um, but depending if they are from the uh, cerebellum or from the cortex or from the hippocampus, they have different patterns of arborization, different sizes. And then the other thing that the cells have is they have to have a very specific way to communicate with each other. 
And the way they do that is by a key and lock mechanism. They use a chemical messenger that are neurotransmitters that one cell produces, and the other cell that has the locks or the receptors are able to communicate with each other. Can you do this with your hand? So we don't touch. But this is, I'm neuron one, I'm dopaminergic neuron, and here's the cell in, that is gonna receive, and by, receive my information. So I'm gonna send to him the dopamine. We're not gonna touch, but he's gonna have the key, and he's gonna be able to understand my message. It doesn't matter if she's trying to touch him too, you know, give him some message. He knows that my message is specific for him because I am producing dopamine, and he has the receptor for dopamine. Because there are different types of neurotransmitters or chemical messengers. There is serotonin, there is GABA, there is acetylcholine, there is noradrenaline, and dopamine. And dopamine is the one that we are talking. So even if she's trying to tell him with acetylcholine something different, he's going to listen to me because he has those receptors. That's the way that neurons can communicate. As you heard before, we work with monkeys. And the reason that we work with monkeys is because it's a way to, to try to get closer to the clinical trials, uh, testing things in the monkeys instead of testing things in the humans. This is monkey that you see here is a common marmoset monkey. They are, they are really, really fun. And um, my lab has been working in developing pluripotent stem cells from the marmoset monkeys. So what we do is like I was saying to you, to you before, we take a small uh, piece of a skin, teeny tiny, and we can um, generate marmoset stem cells. And then we can make those stem cells into baby neurons, or called progenitor neurons. And then we can, what is the word is, pattern the baby neurons, the progenitor neurons, into floor plate midbrain dopaminergic neurons. I say, why, what means this? Well. To be a dopaminergic neuron is not enough. There are several types of dopaminergic neurons in the brain. But the brains that we were talking before, the substantia nigra neurons, are very special. They are just, there is a reason why the cells are located there. So let me tell you how we do that. First, let's start, let's tell, let me tell you how we make these pluripotent stem cells from these fibroblasts. So we take the marmoset, the fibroblasts, we expose them to this, I'm not gonna, give you a test afterwards about these this very strange names. There's factors, and we make them in, reprogram the cells, so the fibroblast becomes pluripotent stem cells, these de-differentiated blank slate cells. And then we need to, before we, make, we want to make them into neurons, we need to make sure that those cells are truly pluripotent stem cells. And the way that we figure that out is because we check that the, res the messengers of the recipe book, remember the, mes the mRNA, the read, the, the recipe book, the DNA? Well, they are, they are telling us that they are producing this, um, this fancy three-letter words that means that are factors that are produced only by, baby, by pluripotent stem cells. Here is to show that they are protein that is being produced. But I think the most important thing when we are looking at pluripotent stem cells, remember that I told you that they can become any type of cell? Well, if you inject those cells into a mouse that is immune deficient, meaning that cannot reject the cells, those cells grow into tumors. That's the reason you don't want pluripotent stem cells being given to you. You need to have them differentiated. Those tumors have, uh, they, can, they have cells that can be um, uh, neurons, they can be muscle, they can be uh, cell gland tissue, glandular tissue, okay? So we know that when we make the cells, we need to prove that those cells are pluripotent. It can become any cell. And then, when we have those pluripotent stem cells, we say, well, now we want to make those cells into those midbrain dopaminergic neurons. But first, we need to make them into neurons, those baby neurons. And if you look at the cells, the fibroblasts, in addition, the microscope, they are not fancy. They, are, they look just like this. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, just like this. You see, it's a kind of blobs all together in a, a kind of like a black and white, basically gray. 
And then, but what is interesting would happen even if you, it doesn't look fancy. The, we expose the cells to these other fancy factors that, that if, if these cells were in the, in the embryo that is going to make a nervous system, will be, those, those cells will receive the same factors. So the cells become, they start making what is called neurospheres. They bunch together. Then they come, they start making, cell, the cells be, start taking that shape that is triangular. And they start to separate. And we can see them, to how they make the cells. Now, let me show you the way that is, I like it. This is the way when we put a specific markers to see the cells, how they look. This is a neurosphere. So what you are seeing here is with the different colors. The blue are the nucleus of all the cells. Remember where the information, the recipe book is? Well, this is all the nucleus. The, uh, the, the red stuff is the protein that is the skeleton of the cells that is going to help the neurons have that shape, those branches. And then the, um, what is the other one? The nesting. The nesting is a protein that is in baby neurons. So when we put these fancy colors, when we use a specific laser, lasers to see these different uh, proteins, this is, and we use some antibodies against the different protein, this is what we see. What is interesting is those cells, this is just to see the, the nuclear, those cells, when they are in the dish, they start organizing themselves. And one of the first things they do, they start making rosettes. They make like tubes. And then, I don't know if you can see how they start making, uh, it's the same story that I was showing you before. You can see how the cells become triangular and start having those extensions, those branches. And it was really nice in the dish. This is in the dish. Then they start to organize and make networks. This is really nice. These are very nice neurons, but they are not necessarily the neurons that we want. We want those specific neurons that are dopaminergic, but also dopaminergic that are just from that area of the brain that's called the substantia nigra when we do our studies. So what do we do? So remember I mentioned to you about this tubing. Um, does anybody has a tube or a piece of paper that I can make a tube? Mm. May I have a Thank you. So when you have an embryo, the way that our brains start is like a tube. The cells are organizing like they will do in an embryo, in a tube, like this. Okay, I will give you the paper, okay? <laughs> so this is what I want to show you. So when, when, we, when we are trying to make those cells, the cells, if we want to make the cells in the, that are in the substantia nigra, we need to think about the, the, the nervous system as a tube, and the nigra will be kind of here. So it will be in the lower end and, in the, and kind of in the middle, because it's the midbrain. So there are specific factors, a gradient of factors, that make those cells become who they are. And so this is from the, the, from the top to the bottom, and then from the front to the back, they have to be have to be around here. Let me show you. We need them right there. That is where the midbrain is. So what we need to do is to replicate, well, to make those cells into dopaminergic neurons, we need to replicate what they would have, uh, uh, they would be exposed when they are in that part of the brain. The cells, when they are growing in, a, in, a, in an embryo, they, they talk to each other with all these different factors. So what we do in a dish, we try to replicate that communication that the cells have with each other. Um, here's to show you how the same cells that I was showing you before, that they are the baby neurons that have the, the, the skeleton proteins, and, uh, and then with those cells, we expose them to those different factors because we want to make them that they are they call ventralization. They're on the bottom of that tube, 
and then we put it all these other different floor plates so they are not just on the tube but are typical of the midbrain. And when we put all those things together, at the end of the day, we get this. And you say, oh, what is this? Well, these are the proteins, TH and ADC. The TH is tyrosine hydroxylase. TH is called the limiting enzyme for the production of dopamine. So these are cells are ready to produce dopamine. They, have, they, have, they are able to read from that recipe book that enzymes, you produce those enzymes that are going to make dopamine. Before, they were not able to do that. They had the recipe book, but they were not prepared to read them. So this young man, this is a student in my lab, is, is called Vermilea, and he has been doing most of this work that you have seen, and he's using those cells to understand mutations in Parkinson's disease and how they affect the development. And the reason is because my lab is trying to make monkeys that have the Parkinson's disease because they have the mutation. And so while he has been working on all this, we have been trying to understand how a marmoset monkey grows and what are the main milestones, because there was very little information out there about how a marmoset grow. And the reason is because we are trying to understand when Parkinson's start. So the stem cells are informing us about how to make this process happen, how this process happen. And this is, big Nancy really wanted me to show you how we compare the baby, the human babies to our marmoset babies. And I can tell you that both like cookies, but there are some things that are very different. Marmosets love to gauge uh, the tree, you know, they like bark, while humans, eh, they prefer the spoons. So, um, so, so with that said, that I told you a little bit about how that we work with in the dish with the stem cells, I want to talk to you about something that I'm very excited, that is about stem cell for therapy. So if you think about uh, stem cell for therapy, um, you can use the cells for delivering, uh, for example, neuroprotective compounds, but you can also use the cells to replace the ones that are lost in the, in the substantia nigra. And I'm coming on this side because, so I don't have, I don't favor one side only. Um, so, Again, we're working with the monkeys, and when we're looking at all these transplants, this is basically transplants trying to put those cells in the area of the brain that are needed. And we work with monkeys because the monkeys produce, have um, behaviors that are very complex, like the humans, but also have, like you can see here, much bigger brains. This is a mouse, a mouse brain, and this is a rhesus monkey brain. And you can see that it's not just the volume, the size that is bigger in a rhesus monkey, but it's also more complex. They have a different um, organization of the structures. So the way that we make until monkeys with Parkinson's, we still don't have those monkeys with a mutation. So what we use is a neurotoxin called MPTP that has been shown in humans in patients to induce Parkinson's like. Do you know the story of MPTP? Anybody knows the story of MPTP? No? Okay, so MPTP was discovered in the early 80s. And the, the way that it happened was uh, uh, young people in California, um, drug addicts, bought a bad batch of heroin. And they injected themselves with heroin. And they developed overnight was what they thought to be catatonic schizophrenia. A fancy word to say that they were basically immobile. They were unable to talk. So this very smart uh, clinician, neurologist called Bill Langston, um, gave to one of the patients one day a pen. And this person wrote in very teeny tiny writing that said, I do not know what happened to me. And Bill thought, wow, that reminds me of Parkinson's, a person that has cognition, but is, has trouble writing. And, uh, and the writing was a small. So he said, OK, what if I give some levodopa to this patient? And he did that. And the patient was able to tell the story of what happened. This just revolutionized the way that we study Parkinson's disease. 
because when we identify the neurotoxins, it's called MPTP, it was tested in uh, monkeys. And to make a longer story short, those animals with MPTP were the basis to what is used today, uh, DBS, deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation was tested in the monkeys with MPTP, and it was shown to uh, be able to help. And this is one of the one of the things we say why we want to do animal research. That's one good example. All right, so let's go back to our story with the stem cells. So if you have uh, you are a normal person, remember the story that we are communicating with a, with us. There you go. We our neurons, my neurons are still producing dopamine. He has the log. Great. We can communicate. But if I got MPTP, my cells are not working. So he has all the, the logs, but he cannot communicate with me. My cells are gone. So what is what we are trying to do with, this, with the stem cells? We put, this, we put this graphs close to him. <laughs> so, uh, they can, so his logs can get the dopamine that are needed. We're trying to repair, to re repair restore the function. So when we started this 14 years ago with Sushan Shang, um, we started working with human embryonic stem cells because that was what, is, was, a, what was the latest thing at the moment. This was after the fetal tissue graft. You probably have heard about the use of fetal tissue for cell repair. But, you know, fetal tissue is, has ethical problems and also availability. Human embryonic stem cells was one step easier, but still you are dealing with ethical problem of how you get it from fetuses. But there is a cell line that was obtained from, uh, um, that we have from human embryonic stem cells. So Sushan make kind of the similar way that I showed you how we make induced pluripotent stem cells into new, in dopaminergic neurons. He did the same thing. And here you have a story again about the TH, TH telling us that the cells are dopaminergic. So he gave me these cells to put in my monkeys with Parkinson's, and we were so excited to see, oh wow, this is gonna work so great. Well, it did not. Only one of the three monkeys had surviving cells, even with immunosuppression. And one of the problems is because the cells were from humans and these were monkeys, so the cells were rejected. And the only way that we could make this work was with a lot of immunosuppression. But you know, even for humans, it was complicated how you show as a paradigm that this can work in humans. These are not the ideal cells. So as we were working on this, came to be induced pluripotent epsilon cells, which I show you that we can make from other cells. So we said with Sushan, okay, let's do it with the monkeys and let's make cells from each one of the monkeys that we want to treat. So we, like I showed you before, we make a small biopsy from one of our rhesus monkeys. So we have these fibroblasts. We make them into induced pluripotent stem cells with all those fancy three-letter words. And then with another bunch of other factors, we make them into dopaminergic neurons. And then we put them back into the brain of the same monkey that has Parkinson's. And lo and behold, it worked. We have these beautiful cells that have all those very nice extensions and ready to communicate. And you can see here, the yellow is because they are producing tyrosine hydroxylase. And you can see here there is another one that are trying to communicate with each other. So we said, wow, this is great. We did, we did this in three animals. We had to start small with help with the Parkinson's Disease Foundation. And with that information, with that data, we got big grant that which have, we have been working for the last five years. And um, so we have this 16 monkeys that they have Parkinson's disease and with some of the animals got their own cells they were transformed into dopaminergic neurons. Some animals got cells from another monkey and some monkeys got just a regular tissue culture fluid C or CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. And we follow the animals with a bunch of behavioral tests and all this and imaging to see how the cells were doing in the brain. We follow the animals for two years. We, the animals have, oops, the animals had um, the MPTP, so they were Parkinsonian for one year, so they were well-established Parkinsonism, and then we put the cells. Actually, imagine these are 16 monkeys, a lot of work, 
and we were doing it on waves. And in the middle of the, doing this study, um, that we, we started making cell, putting the cells um, the way that we did it before. We, we were putting approximately two and a half million cells per animal. And we noticed as the time was passing, we tried to do things in a blind fashion, so we do not have a bias to find the positive results. But at some point, some certain points, you need to analyze what's going on. Is the animal, is this working or not? To be able to do a smart decisions. We were not seeing much effect. And what is interesting was one of our colleagues that is called uh, Uli Saxon in Harvard published, following basically our same paradigm, that the only time that he found some positive behavioral effect was when he put 40 million cells. And we said, oh boy, this is not gonna work. We need to put the right number of cells in the right, cell, in the right place. We knew that our cells were m uh, more um, efficiently, efficiently pro pro uh, transforming to dopaminergic neurons. But still, we needed more than what we were placing. So uh, we have all this different, this is just to show you that we have one stem cell line per monkey. It was a ton of work. So we decided, so, so we said we have these beautiful cells. How we make sure that the cells can be placed into the brain? So I said to Sushan, so I've, we, we are having use for the last few years um, a system to deliver things in the brain that improve how accurate is our targeting. And it's called real, um, auto, um, excuse me, intraoperative MRI. So we put things inside the MRI. You have, have, probably some of you have had an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging scan. So what we are doing is we've been deliver, uh, making a system that we can do the surgery with the animal in the MRI magnet and deliver the cells there so we can see them. So we can improve the, uh, the accuracy. And where accuracy is pretty good. So these are the, how the, the, the crosshairs of our system. So this is our target. And you can see these are and under two millimeter accuracy. This is basically the limit of the sensitivity of the system that we have. So Sushan said, this is gonna work. But, he said, but I said to him, we need to make it, make sure that the process is faster than what we are using. So my friends in medical physics develop a system that's called real-time intraoperative MRI. So our targeting, we can acquire imaging as it is being produced. So we, have, we, we spend less time targeting the cells in the brain. And one of us, I'm not sure if you're gonna see it, but one of the advantages of the system is this, the catheter that we use is made of silica and it's clear, it's made of glass. And um, you can, we can see the cells when they are inside the catheter. And that is a huge advantage. And um, this is to tell you, is, it's not just the cells that you need, you need to have a good delivery system to make things work. This is for cells, for gene therapies, for any drugs that you are taking, you need to make sure that they get to the brain at the right, in the right area. So this is to show you when we put, I'm gonna go back to the previous image. So you see how our system is, this is the base that we use, and this is like a joystick. This thing, that little, the little stick here, it moves in here like a joystick, and this, this wider stuff here is a lock. And so when we are in the right place, we can lock it in place. So the way, so when we do the surgery, we plan ahead, where are we gonna put the base? And the, we, if we put it here, we know that this is the area that we can target inside the brain. So when we do our surgery, we said, okay, here is where we want our target to be and we think about in 3D. Then the next thing we do is we match the, the trajectory of the cannula that is here to the area that we want. We move it in this joystick until it's exactly where we want it. And then we, we put down the brain this stick, the, the catheter, and we can see it get in there. So we know exactly where it is. 
And this is just to show you that what we did with our monkeys in the new study, we put around 20 to 30 million cells per monkey, per hemisphere. And you can see how we put three needle tracks, and you can see here how accurate we can do it inside this area of the brain. So if you have any questions, let me know. So uh, this is imaging with uh, a radio ligand that is called carbon-11 DTBC. And what it does is let me see dopaminergic neurons when they are working. They, are, they have, the dopaminergic neurons have what is called, this protein called vesicular monoamine transporter 2. Fancy name. But um, the DTBC, let me see dopaminergic neurons that have this, this, um, whoop, these cells. So when you have, my monkeys have not bilateral Parkinsonism, my monkeys have unilateral Parkinsonism, so they are not so sick and they can take care of themselves. Um, so what, when you have unilateral Parkinsonism, like my monkeys, you lose the uptake of this dopaminergic marker in one area of the brain. You see here, just put one arrow so you can see it. What is interesting is the animals that got the grafts, they, after the eight months later, we could see that cells were actively working in the brain. And we have four monkeys here that you can see where uh, the cells are. You can see there's one, two, three, four monkeys, and they have the uptake in that area of the brain. I think what is interesting is when we look at the behavior, and we are, you are basically the first ones to see all our new data. We, just, we are just finishing this study. And so I only have until 18 months, but we have the data. Maybe soon you will see it. And here, would you see these three bars? Are the, is the score that we saw in these animals. This is the overall clinical rating of score. The higher the score, the worse the animals are, the more Parkinsonian the animals are. So here you have the blue, that is our controls, the orange, that is the animals that got the same cells the, from themselves, and the other one, the gray, is the animals that got the cells from another monkey that they were dopaminergic. And what we saw is starting basically at at six months, we start seeing an, an improvement in the animals that have the um, autologous, meaning the same cells. And we see that in overall, and also I just choose two things to show you today. The gait is improved and the slowness of movement. Some of the animals that have the allogenic, meaning the, the cells from another monkey, improve some, but not so much. And the reason is because we put a lot less cells. And let me show you what we see when we saw. We start, and we are in this moment analyzing the tissue of these animals. After the two years we were we necropsy them, we basically euthanized the last animal three weeks ago. So we're just in the process of working on this. So again, remember that I told you about the TH, the tyrosine hydroxylase, that enzyme is critical to make dopamine. So our the, the graft, this is an animal that got the allogenic graft, the graft that are the cells from another monkey. We see these tiny grafts. The tiny grafts are producing tyrosine hydroxylase, and you hear a closer look. And we know that it's our graft because we label the cells to produce a protein that's called green fluorescent protein. And it's not green because we use a different marker to make it easier to see. But um, here you can see the cells, this dark spot. These are the cells of our graft, and here you see a closer look. But I think what was in most interesting for us is what we are seeing in the animals that go the autologous. We are seeing much bigger graphs that are across several levels of the brain. And this is the TH, and this is the GFP. So now what we are doing is a lot of work trying to make sure that the, all the animals are the same, how much immunoreactivity. We are not seeing some, some side effects, but you know there's a lot of work to do with this. So, with all the things that I told you about, what is the take-home message from my talk? Well, first of all, remember cell-based strategies for Parkinson's disease, are, we can use them for a lot of different things. 
for modeling disease in a dish, but also for therapies. If you think about how we make dopaminergic neurons, those mid-range dopaminergic neurons, it's complex. It's really complex. And to make is in a stepwise process and that resembles the way that neurodevelopment happened as when we were fetus. Stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons help us understand how PD occurs and is helping us with because it let us taste different mutations, different toxins, different uh, and different treatments that can help. And the last thing is I think our ongoing studies in monkeys that is telling us that when you have better methods of producing and delivering the cells, um, we can have a functional engrafting. And we, I think we can get better functional results. And with that said, I want to thank my team because it takes a, really a team to make this possible. Um, and especially Scott, that I mentioned to you before, and Sushan, who are really uh, little engines to make this happen. And with that said, I'll be glad to, uh, to answer any question. Thank you for listening. <laughs>